Hi, it's Dwyer, gamblersadvisory.com, DwyerVIP.com, on Roku, Dwyer Boxing, and Sports News. Remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now, I'm recovering from a car crash yesterday. Um, while I didn't make a big deal about it, you should know about it, right? Because I want you to see the upside and the downside to gambling. Right now, I had the under yesterday in the NBA playoff game, the under 203.5 points. So I had everything going for me with less than 10 seconds left in that game. Right? Both teams were under 100. In other words, I was comfortably on the under. I had, in my opinion, the best player on the globe with the basketball. The score was tied, so Cleveland is comfortably within the six points. Understand, at that point, I could have survived a three-point play, a four-point play. I was that deep in the money, right? Cleveland would have had to have collapsed by six points. So LeBron James has the basketball with less than 10 seconds left in a game that's under, right? And you know the rest. LeBron shoots it, misses, Shumpert gets the ball, shoots it, misses. We go into overtime. In other words, Cleveland's within six. Hell, the game's tied at the end of regulation. The game's under at the end of regulation. The game doesn't go over until three minutes into the overtime. Cleveland, of course, doesn't score a point in that overtime for several minutes. I lose on the Cleveland plus six. I lose on the under, even though I was winning on both. With less than 10 seconds left in regulation with LeBron James having that basketball. That's the life of gambling, right? If you're not ready for losses like that, when the game is all good, when Cleveland is giving Golden State a run for the money, if you're not ready for that, then gambling's not for you. These videos aren't for you. Now let's uh, talk about some of the things happening in boxing. Julio Cesar Chavez Jr. Julio Cesar Chavez Jr. is teamed up with great trainer Robert Garcia. Let me say this. In recent years, his skills have eroded because of what I believe has been a very long time of him not being diligent in the gym, not being diligent in training, right? It says a lot when Freddie Roach, who really is about, you know, training championship boxers, decides that he doesn't need you as part of his stable, even though you're still a cash cow in the sport. I believe Chavez might never make it back. He has that much work to do. He looked awful to me against Funfara, right? I thought he looked awful in a few fights, the Brian Vera fights. I thought he looked awful, right? He's a talented guy, but understand, success is a process, not a snapshot. You can't neglect your work and then suddenly show up and say, you know what, today I'm going to be serious and expect to be where you would have been or where you were when you were a diligent student. So he's with a superstar trainer. I thought Joe Goosen, the guy he just fired, was a superstar trainer, right? He's with another superstar trainer. The question really is, is whether his skills have eroded to the point where he can't make it back. Let's shift gears. Oscar De La Hoya is threatening to come back. Oscar, please don't. Right? First off, you're a superstar promoter. Right? You're doing well for yourself. Why not continue to do well in that capacity? Right? Don't detract from Golden Boy Promotions by leaving your executive suite and then saying, you know what, company, I'm going to take three or four months off on some quixotic quest to take on a younger lion, right? I hate to say it, but part of getting old is knowing when your time has passed, right? 
Oscar's skills had deteriorated greatly at the end of his career. Understand, Oscar was fighting a lot of guys who were physically smaller than him. Steve Forbes, for example. Right? Oscar was not taking the biggest challenges toward the end of his career. Even the Manny Pacquiao fight, and I understand he lost that fight. I understand Pacquiao is a future Hall of Famer. But Manny had never fought above 135. Right? Oscar agreed to fight him at 147. Right? Understand that fight really shouldn't have been competitive. Oscar was cherry picking when he picked Manny Pacquiao. Now it turned out he made a big mistake. But just to understand, you know, the Oscar you remember, the guy fighting for the middleweight title against Bernard Hopkins, that guy stopped existing a long time ago. Right? We've heard about Oscar's problems outside of the ring. Right? He's been in rehab, folks. The drugs he was using were, let's say, harder than alcohol or cannabis. Right? Much harder. And so, put me as, you know, a skeptic of Oscar coming back against Triple G, as he told TMZ he wants to come back for. Right? If Gennady Golovkin respects and loves his sport, he won't take that fight, right? Um, Paulie Malinaji believes that Luis Calazo is going to give Keith Thurman problems early on. If the fight stays in the pocket, I believe Calazo would. Calazo is excellent in the pocket. But if I had to bet on that fight, I'd take Thurman because, in my opinion, Thurman is much more mobile than any of us want to give him credit for, right? I encourage everyone to look at the Jan Zavek fight you're going to see Thurman moving around the ring on his back foot. I thought he was much more mobile than Robert the Ghost Guerrero. I believe that mobility would give Colazzo all kinds of trouble. Let's shift gears. Timothy Bradley is taking on Jesse Vargas. In my opinion, these two guys are from opposite sides of the street. I'm a Vargas skeptic. I personally believe Alec Verde have beat him. Right? Wasn't awarded the decision. But if you look at the combu box numbers and if you look at the fight, you really have to wonder how the fight was scored that way. Go back and look at Vargas against Jose Cito Lopez. Right? I thought Lopez was roughing up Vargas for stretches of that fight. I view Vargas as, and I understand he's been involved with big names, the Mayweathers, Roy Jones Jr. I view Vargas as overrated. That's the side of the street I have him on. Now, Timothy Bradley, by contrast, in broad daylight, seems to me to be one of the more underrated fighters in the sport. I wasn't kidding when I said that before Bradley lost the rematch to Manny Pacquiao, right, the hurt calf fight, that I thought that an argument could be made that Bradley had a claim to this era. He was unbeaten at the time. had beaten Manny Pacquiao, right, and that Bradley really should be the opponent Floyd Mayweather fought. For supremacy, because if you look at Bradley's record, he beat Kendall Holt when Kendall Holt was dangerous. He beat Devin Alexander when Devin Alexander was unbeaten. Right? He's beaten Juan Manuel Marquez. Right? He beat Manny Pacquiao. Now, I know that first fight, people want to say it's controversial. Okay, fair enough. He goes the distance against Manny Pacquiao. He wins several of the later rounds, right? At the end of that fight, he's not fading. He's on the comeback. He has two sprained ankles, right? Let's face it, too. We know he beat Diego Chavez. I understand the judges, whatever. Uh, we know, too, that he beat Richlin Provotnikov. So, in my opinion, Timothy Bradley, for all the glory he's gotten, is an underrated fighter. I think this is a major opportunity for him. I don't think Jesse Vargas fights that well low. I don't think Jesse Vargas moves that well. Maybe Vargas has good technique. Okay, fair enough. He doesn't have the kind of punch to scare a Timothy Bradley. The kind of guy who gives Bradley problems is a Kendall Holt, right, who almost decapitated Bradley. Look at that fight. And it's a Richland Provotnikov, where these guys have bombs. They can unload the bomb on Bradley, and Bradley then has to get off the canvas to make things happen. Right? 
but light hitting guys, guys who really don't have, you know, the big pop. I think Bradley can outwork both inside and outside. So I like Timothy Bradley over Jesse Vargas. We'll see what happens in that fight, right? I'll do a follow-up video when that fight's upon us. Well, both Cotto and Gill made weight. Let me support Gary Shaw 100%. Gary Shaw, the promoter for Daniel Gill, said, Hey, I don't like catch weights in boxing. He said, Look, you know, uh, if you are the champion for a weight class, let's face it, the middleweight belt is the 160-pound title. That's what we need to start calling it, the 160-pound title. Right? If you are the 160 pound champion, you can come in whatever weight you want as long as it's 160 or less. So if you're on your game at 156, you feel it gives you a little extra speed, a little more maneuverability. If you're on your game at 158, okay, go ahead. Come in at that weight. Look at Bernard Hopkins' middleweight career. He comes in at 157, 158 often. Often. You want to do that? Hey, I got no problem with that. But don't force the other guy who's fighting for the 160-pound championship to come in at some artificial weight less than 160 pounds. Folks, you're fighting for the 160-pound belt. You can't tell a man you're fighting for the 160-pound belt, but you got to come in at 157. Right? To me, champions are being abusive. They're being abusive when they say, you know what, I'll give you a shot at my title, but you can't fight at the title weight. To me, that's bad news. You know, I used to be here online, and I thought one of the biggest things going for Floyd Mayweather was the fact that while Manny Pacquiao was Manny Catchweight Pacquiao, right? You'd hear about a Pacquiao fight, you knew a catchweight was involved, right? Even the Pacquiao-Chris Algieri fight. Algeria had to come in at something like 143 and a half, right? You know, Floyd Mayweather always kept it real, right? You know, his titles were actually title fights at the title weight. Then Mayweather disappointed me, right? He fights Canelo at a catch weight, 152. Now, while I think Mayweather kicks his butt at 154, I haven't seen that. I was deprived of seeing that because these guys fought for that title, but Canelo wasn't allowed to weigh that weight, right? So I hear about this catch weight in this Cotto fight, and I'm like, come on, man. 157, really, for the 160-pound title? If it's a title fight, have it be a title weight. Maybe what boxing needs to do, because guys are hiding behind words, right? Middleweight title. So guys say, oh, you know what? Who's going to figure out that we have a catch weight here at less than middleweight? Right? You know, the fans don't fully understand that middleweight means 160. Welter means 147. Right? Super Welter's 154. Right? Commission should force these fighters to actually advertise the fight as a fight for the 154-pound title or the 160-pound title, right? Force the fighter to have uncomfortable moments in the press conference where they say, you know what, that's right, I didn't want Daniel Gill fighting me in 160, even though this fight's for the 160 title, right? Reduce it to numbers. In any event, both Cotto and Gill made weight. If Daniel Gill, who's in his 30s, isn't in the ring thinking about the calories he missed, thinking about the three pounds he had to lose past the 160-pound weight limit, if he's actually there healthy enough to fight, this is going to be a difficult fight for Miguel Cotto. You know, the public really gets obsessed with dramatic knockouts, with car crashes, we see Golovkin drop Gill. We see Gill on the canvas at the end of that fight. We see the referee waving it off. We see the glassiness in Gill's eyes, the hurt, the pain. And then, of course, many of us are going to say, wow, you know, that guy was overwhelmed. It's over for that guy. Not just tonight, but forever. 
That's a mistake, folks. Styles make fights. Right? Daniel Gill, the bigger man, is going to be in the ring moving laterally, circling. Miguel Cotto, who is predominantly one-handed. Right? Cotto's a left hook. It's a devastating left hook. He hits you in the ribs. I've seen more than one man just wince, go down. I saw an unbeaten Carlos Quintana overwhelmed by that left hand. Right? It's a game changer. No question about it. But just understand that Daniel Gill's accustomed to fighting guys with game changers. That movers can find ways to avoid your plan A, your big punch. Right? Daniel Gill will cover up that side of his body. I think Gill here is a live dog. I love Cotto, but it wasn't so long ago that Cotto was being beaten by Austin Trout. Right? It wasn't. It wasn't so long ago that we were questioning Cotto's future. Right? So I understand he beat an excellent Sergio Martinez, but the Sergio Martinez he fought that night. Was that a healthy Sergio Martinez? Would that Sergio Martinez have beaten the Sergio Martinez who fought the first 11 rounds of the fight against Chavez Jr.? So Cotto at middleweight, just close your eyes for a second and ask the question, who has he fought at middleweight? <laughs> who? Who was healthy? Right? In fact, let's go deeper. Cotto at 154. Who has he fought at 154? Please, don't confuse Yuri Foreman with Daniel Gill. You want another injured person? Antonio Margarito. Right? Wasn't his eye a concern going into that fight? Right? As far as I know, Daniel Gill has two good legs and two good eyes. For this fight against Miguel Cotto. With all due respect, Delvin Rodriguez, hey, he's a nice fighter. Is Delvin Rodriguez one of the Lions at 154 pounds in your book? You know what? I know Freddie Roach has helped Miguel Cotto's uh, game tremendously. Understand before, fighters didn't quite know what to expect. Didn't quite know the Freddie Roach edition of Miguel Cotto. Now, just like you're watching this video, a guy can say, okay, let me see Cotto against Delvin Rodriguez. Let me see Cotto against Sergio Martinez. Right? Let me notice the wrinkles Freddie Roach has put into his game. The element of surprise is not quite there. The other problem, too, is the fighter he's fighting. Right? You may have noticed that Daniel Gill has held a belt multiple times. Right? You, you may have noticed Daniel Gill is the kind of guy who has traveled internationally for big fights and has held his own against the house fighter. So to me, this is going to be a very tough match. I do not expect Miguel Cotto to walk through Daniel Gill. I don't expect the fight we had in the Sergio Martinez fight where Gill gets pulverized early in the bout like Cotto pulverized Martinez and then the other fighter is not able to recover. We haven't seen Cotto at 160 or 157, right, for the way. And I'm sure by the time the fight goes off, they'll both be in the 160s. We haven't seen Cotto in a real competitive match at 160 that actually lingers into the middle rounds, where one guy is not reeling, unable to really put pressure on his knee. Right? Understand, Sergio Martinez hasn't fought since that fight. Martinez is thinking about his future. Martinez himself in interviews has said that his knee is still recovering. Right? And so, this fight's much more competitive, much more competitive than I think the public realizes. Right? People are talking about Cotto Canelo. Folks, you need to focus right here on Cotto Gill in many ways. I consider Gil to be a tougher opponent for Miguel Cotto than Saul Alvarez. I'll tell you what, 
Gil is much more fluid. Gil has the faster hand speed than Saul Alvarez. Food for thought, right? Certainly, Gil is older and has traveled more for fights than Saul Alvarez. So put me among those who feels that Daniel Gill is a live underdog. I'll agree, Cotto's dangerous. I'll agree, Cotto looks magnificent. Right, this fight is an iffy fight. But I'll say the value play here, in my opinion, is with Daniel Gill. Right? Should be a great fight. Gill made weight earlier this morning. It's definitely worth your attention. You need to be aware of this fight. Understand it's a current champ against a past champ. Right? Don't be fooled by the Golovkin loss that Gil had. Golovkin is a bit of an outlier and fights a completely different fight than does Miguel Cotto. That's how I see it. Let me hear from you. If you want to comment on any part of this video, the Cavalier game last night, or should I say the Golden State Warrior game, since I'm in the Bay Area, Julio Cesar Chavez joining with trainer Robert Garcia. Right? Colazzo, Keith Thurman, their match. Bradley, Jesse Vargas, their match. Right? Cotto, Gill, their match. Please feel free to leave those comments in the comment section to this video. Thanks for stopping by.